get this on, on tape and get it really timed wonderfully. Roger Drummer is a diplomate of Chinese herbology. He travels throughout North America lecturing on nutrition and the benefits of Chinese herbal healing. Roger holds a U.S. patent for growing some very special medicinal mushrooms. He has studied a variety of healing modalities, including Jin Shin Do, Shiatsu, and Pranic Healing. He has created product lines for nutritional supplements, and he formulizes personalized herb to tonics. And he has some pretty high profile uh, clients as well. He has created um, nutritional programs for literally tens of thousands of people. Roger is a published writer, certified herbologist, certified nutritionist, a runner, a cycling enthusiast, a former triathlete, a husband, and a father of three girls. So today we are indeed fortunate to have with us Roger Drummer. Please give him a warm welcome. I have my own mic. Thank you. Are we on with the sound? Sounds like it. Well, hi. I'm really happy to be here, and I've had a great time already. <laughs> so I want to tell you a little bit about how I got into Chinese herbology, and, and if you're you know, uncertain about what a diplomat of Chinese herbology is, it means that I'm allowed to practice Chinese medicine, but I can't put needles in people. Uh, years ago, they realized so many people were being educated in the system to produce acupuncturists, and when they got out of school, the one thing that most of them really didn't want to do was put needles in people. And so they created a different licensing for them so that they could actually practice Chinese medicine. Now, I had a very unique um, start in Chinese herbology myself. I've never actually gone to school. Um, I was just happened to be in L.A. for three months to study shiatsu, and I was suffering from chronic fatigue. So I was going into a little herb shop to get some herbs and was taken on as an apprentice. And I figured it would be a good, time, good thing for me to do to hang around the shop because I was on disability from an auto accident. There wasn't much going on in my life, and I was doing my little thing with shiatsu. And I happened to be hanging around the shop one day and had an experience drinking a cup of herbs. And from that experience, I decided I had to stick around the shop to find out what actually happened to me. Um, and what happened to me, I was walking down the street, extremely stressed out and low energy, chronic fatigue, hadn't felt good for years. And I had a feeling of my entire energy changing. And at that exact moment, I had energy. And I felt completely different. And that state of energy went on for a good seven to 10 days. And it was surprising because no one else in the room, the 10 people that had drank the same exact tea, had any experience of it at all. And so the next 12, 14 years that I spent at that shop was basically my way of figuring out what exactly happened to me. And so I've gone from being this guy who was wandering around Venice, California to study shiatsu for a few months, who was extremely shy, extremely introverted to where uh, I had an experience walking down the street and ended up at an herb shop, and it's now progressed to the point where I'm actually, you know, from looking at that one simple experience in my life and then studying other healing modalities to try and figure out what it was actually about, that has progressed from, from that state to where now I'm in town actually on this very same day. We were meeting with a group of doctors to start a clinical trial on Alzheimer's based on the exact same experience that I had years ago and how my understanding of that experience has expanded out through my own life and other people's lives and my understanding about how herbs work and stress response works and how almost all disease is really just related back to simple energetic principles in the body. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about diabetes or you're talking about heart disease or you're talking about Alzheimer's. They all have a component of the exact same thing, which is stress, excessive stress, and how that affects your entire system. But when you look at even excessive stress energetically, it's based on the same exact 
parts of your brain and your body as having a spiritual experience, having a state of bliss or having a deep meditation to where you go into altered states is based on the exact same energy centers in your body as having a, an extreme freak out and a stress response. And so it all depends on what's actually happening in those different energy centers and the glands that they're related to as to what kind of response you're actually going to have. And we all know there's all kinds of research that shows that people that meditate all the time have different brain chemistry. And people that don't, that just you know, participate in a normal living environment where they're stressed out all of, every day, have totally different responses to same experiences based on their brain chemistry at the moment. But that brain chemistry is influenced by what you ate that morning, um, what you've been eating for a long period of time, what you do for recreation, and even the person who meditates all the time and has developed a different brain chemistry, so to speak, it's not just based on sitting there and thinking different thoughts or chanting different words or different nutrition. There's a whole energetic light aspect that happens in the body when you sit down and do that. So if you can learn, and this has been part of my whole journey of learning what happened to me, if you can learn how to match up how your energy body and the human body interfaces with the universe energetically with nutrition that's, and herbs that do somewhat the same thing, then it's no different than taking someone who's a really good runner and setting them up with their first pair of Nike shoes. They run better, they feel better about themselves, everything functions better, they have better clothes. All these things add to an environment of how your body and energy body will respond to everything. So herbs could be the, the one catalyst to opening you, opening you up to having a different experience of just your normal everyday things that are going on. And so my, la my journey for the last 20 years has really just been about how to make formulas for people that allow them to have somewhat of a different experience of their life and have it be a big moment changing, life changing experience to where they now know that um, their life can be completely different depending on what they eat, what they take in their bodies, and what they do every single day. And so when you look at chronic stress, though, even modern medicine says that it's, it's you know, related to 80 to 90 percent of all illness. And yet nobody really understands what that means. And everybody, when you talk to them, seem to think that they know all about stress because they know that they're tense, they get headaches, they get upset, they get angry, they don't handle things well but they don't really realize deep inside their system what's actually going on with all of it and why it's even related to anything like chronic disease. But the reality is you cannot be dealing with someone with diabetes or heart disease or even memory loss or anything unless you deal with the stress response because it's so um, deeply rooted in their body and changes every single physical aspect of what goes on that if you don't deal with it then you're just dealing with surface issues with everything. And for example with diabetes when you have a stress response which almost every single person does when they don't like their job as soon as the alarm clock goes off they have a stress response. Uh, even just missing two hours of sleep puts you into a stress response. And as soon as that actually happens your body now does not produce insulin the same way because the stress response is based on fight or flight which developed millions of years ago. So now you're in fight or flight and you haven't done anything except shut off the clock and stumble out to the kitchen and maybe burn your toast which has now created another small stress response. And so your body now does not produce enough insulin and it won't for a couple of hours. So when you put the donut or the, just the toast and the coffee and some sugar in your body, which elevates your blood sugar way up, there's no insulin response really to clear it out because your body thinks you're frightened and that you're really scared and that you need to run away from something because that's the signal it's getting. So right away you have lessened amount of insulin going through your system. So throughout the entire day now that you eat food that keeps raising your blood sugar too high, you're still having stress response because even that breakfast you had puts you in a position to have many more stress responses throughout the day. So now you're at work, you're stressed out too much, you're eating all these foods that raise your blood sugar too much, and you're really not producing insulin very well. And all of a sudden, basically because of that one poor night's sleep 
and that breakfast, you're all pre-diabetic. And so you're just on the road to, to developing diabetes. And if you don't do something to calm your nervous system and get you out of that and make you feel present at the moment, then you won't be able to actually shut off that response. And more than likely, you will end up being one of the half the people in the country that end up with diabetes and all the other health issues that come along with it. And yet, you can go to a doctor. They'll never explain to you why your body is reacting the way it is with diabetes. They'll never explain to you that stress has anything to do with it. And so you just end up being put on the pill. And so the reality is, though, is that that one disease, if you look at it from how it basically happens in the body, and this is fun, funny because I travel all over the country and talk about um, chronic illness, and diabetes is a hot topic because usually a third of the people in the room have it. And so, but none of them can actually explain anything that's going on in their system with diabetes because no one's ever told them. And it's a very simple thing. The fact is there's too much blood sugar and no cells to actually stick it in, so it just stays in your bloodstream. And you can change that whole paradigm in your body within a few meals. You can actually be on the, your way within a day or two of actually getting rid of type 2 diabetes. And you know how huge that would be if people just woke up and became aware that it's not a disease? Type 2 diabetes is not actually a disease. It's just your cells responding to the signals that you are giving it every single day. So if you change the signals, it actually goes away. For most people, it takes less than 30 days. The amount of money that's spent on that one disease based on just stress and the type of food that you eat is the same amount of money that um, the whole health care issue that Obama wanted to put through would have cost the American public every single year. It's the same exact amount of money. It would just disappear. The reality is, is that everybody can change that right away, but again, you have to deal with it um, with your stress and you become more conscious, and that can happen just by sitting down and having a meal. And the same exact meal might be the same meal that could start to stop your loss of memory. The fact that most people think they're sitting here and they, their, their memory's going, they, don't, they just don't, can't pick up thoughts as easily or explain things as easily, and they think, well, I'm getting old and it's related to, you know, you know somebody in my family had Alzheimer's, and they don't realize it could just be the fact that they've ate a really bad breakfast that didn't give their brain anything that it actually needed to turn on and that they're stressed out. Because the, the fact that if you ate a protein when you started your breakfast out, your brain would make dopamine. And dopamine is the nutrient your brain, or the neurotransmitter your brain uses to power up your brain for the entire day. It's also the made in the same center of your brain that turns on when you meditate. It's also the same area of your brain that controls your cravings for sweets. And it's, so it's all interrelated to that one little meal. And if you miss it, then you crave sugar all day long. Your brain feels foggy all day long. And you can't access memories very well. And you think you have some issue with getting old and you're just, your brain just doesn't work well anymore. And the reality is it just didn't get what it wanted in the morning. And then when you have a stress response on top of that, the moment you have a stress response, it shuts off the same area of your brain that makes dopamine, and all your reasoning goes away. And so your ability to actually make conscious decisions about why you're stressed out and, and the relationships you have at work because you're stressed out is almost impossible because that part of your brain doesn't work anymore. It's shut off for the entire day. So all these things are just patterns that keep that are all interrelated, yet nobody sees that there's a relation to just stress and what they ate in the morning, and they can make a huge impact on any chronic illness just by paying attention to those simple things. It's the same way with heart disease. We all buy into this idea that, that um, cholesterol is this evil thing that your body produces that creates heart disease. And in the last 20 years, we've progressed to the point where we spend about $15 billion a year on statin drugs for heart disease. And I'm sure a few people actually need to take those, but the reality is from the time that statin drugs were invented to the time that we now spend $15 billion a year on them, heart disease has gone from the number two killer in America to number one. So where would it have gone if we didn't have 
15 billion dollars of the drug spent on it? Why didn't it make an impact? How could it go from number two to number one if we had all these amazing things that take care of heart disease? Because again, we're just looking at one little thing and not looking at the fact that people have poor nutrition, that they have too much stress, and how that affects every single part of your system. And with heart disease, the big issue, and you can probably throw in high blood pressure too, but the big issue is that when you have a stress response and you're stuck in that almost all day, and this is what's so dangerous about it, is that the stress response was normally set up and, and cleared out of your body within an hour or two. Because, you know, a million years ago, you didn't have that many things going on that was stimulating. You got frightened. If you lived through it, you got over it and went on with something else. Um, today, you get a stress response by not having a great breakfast. You get a stress response in traffic. You get a stress response from your emails. You get a stress response checking your emails while you're driving and stuck in traffic. <laughs> And then now you get a stress response because you're no longer allowed to look at your emails in your car while you're driving, so you've got to hide your phone while you do it. So it's all a stress response. And then you don't realize that because you're locked into that and you don't get out of it because every hour at work something happens that you're upset about. Your kids now, you know, you can't even get away from your kids for more than 15 minutes because they can text you now and talk to you. And, it used to be you'd have to make a phone call and catch them at home, right? Which is, we're now seeing that was such a blessing. And so <laughs> the reality is, is that you're having these responses all day long, and every single time you have one, your heart beats a little harder. And every time it beats a little harder, your blood goes a little faster through every part of your vascular system. And every part of your vascular system reacts to that because there's more blood and force coming through it than it's supposed to. So it's kind of like if you, if you imagine trying to hook up a, a fire engine hose to a garden hose and forcing all that through it. That's what your heart beating too much during stress does. So every part of your vascular system has to tense up around it to hold it in. And when it does that, it kind of squirts it back to your heart harder. And then it comes back and hits it harder. And this just goes on all day long, back and forth, too hard, too hard. And so your body creates all this internal inflammation because all that extra pressure causes cellular damage and your body needs nutrients to actually fix it. And so if it doesn't have it, then you have inflammation all over your entire body and you don't really relate it to the fact that you have too much stress because the excessive hormone in and of itself is a very powerful inflammatory chemical. And so that adds to the inflammation that's in your arteries and because you're having a stress response and you didn't eat very well, you have too much sugar. Sugar is like one of the most inflammatory chemicals ever. And when you mix that with the excessive stress hormone, now you have this inflammation going on all over your system. And then the big thing about nutrition and how it all ties in is that when you're stressed and you're having a stress response, your body actually requires much more nutrition than it normally would. It is, especially even with diabetics, it can be almost six times as much nutrition is required by a diabetic because they have that much more inflammation. In fact, diabetes is considered a disease of accelerated aging due to inflammation. The neuropathy in your feet, the neuropathy that's affecting your eyes is really just inflammation. And so when you combine that with a poor diet, and the fact that your body now requires more nutrition, it actually has more stress because you're not giving it to it. And so what happens with that person who doesn't pay attention to their diet or doesn't have a plan, then they end up eating worse because the number one thing that everybody does when, they, when they're stressed out is they try to find something that makes them feel better instantly. And the four biggies for that are sugar, alcohol, tobacco, and drugs. They work really fast and they change the way you feel almost instantly. And so the only way to get out of that, that whole cycle of reaching for that when you're stressed, is to make a commitment and a plan to actually feel better before you get stressed. To actually have some sort of plan that makes you feel better every single day so that you're not going to feel so bad and so out of balance that the first thing you grab is sugar. The first thing that you do is, is a drug or tobacco or alcohol instantly because you don't feel that bad because your body got what it needed that morning and you had something that lifted you up and made, you, made it much easier for you to get throughout your day. 
That's one of the things I always look at when I sit down and do an herb program or I make an herb product or any type of a product. You have to look at how you're setting that person's energy up for a stress response, how you lessen.